today's topic is uh, nucleic acids under nucleic acids we'll be initially studying about uh, the properties of the dna later on we'll get into the historical discoveries of dna and parallelly we'll be looking at the occurrence of dna the chemical composition of the dna as well as the basic model of the dna and uh, it'll be followed with uh, most of the cluster we'll be doing a cluster analysis with relation to what questions come with relation to nucleic acids dna rna at the composite level now uh, when you take all living organisms all living organisms are characterized by the presence of the genetic material so presence of the genetic material is a unique character of all living organisms now in living organisms nucleic acids help in storage of the genetic information they basically are the repositories of the genetic information from times immemorial so they function in storage of the genetic material that is the most important function of the nucleic acids and they are also the source of source of variation variation which is driven through evolution like if you take right from escherichia coli to plants as well as algae fungi neurospora or else um, you take even aspergillus or else you take drosophila melanogaster in all of these the nucleo the nucleic acids the nucleic acid material either in the form of a dna or in the form of an rna is responsible for variation that is any sort of a change which occurs in the sort of a genetic information by means of which the uh, the organism develops superior characters the third important property of the genetic material we are talking in terms of we are dealing with relation to in terms of properties of the genetic material what are the basic properties of the genetic material the first one is storage the second one is it shows variation and the third one is the genetic material is always stable it is stable through generations it is stable through time and space that is it does not lose its sort of an integrity so the integrity of the genetic material is very important in terms of expression of biochemical characters or physical attributes like phenotype etc and the fourth important feature is it is able to replicate when you say replication it implies dna making its own dna so replication of the dna that is the dna making another strand of the dna is with high fidelity the meaning of the term high fidelity is it retains the original genetic information high fidelity so high fidelity is it is error free so error free transmission of the genetic information in the form of nucleotides is a characteristic feature again of the sort of a dna or the genetic material and while maintaining its replication it is able to encode the phenotype encode the phenotype so encoding that is the dna is endowed with an inherent property wherein the dna can transmit the information via the rna and into the proteins which primarily has been elucidated by crick and which is termed as a central dogma so the mechanism by means of which the genetic information is encoded into the amino acid sequence of the proteins is primarily the process of protein synthesis
So primarily coming to the properties, the first property is storage, second one is variation, third one is the DNA stable, fourth it is able to replicate and fifth one it is able to encode for the sort of a phenotype. So these are the basic properties of any particular sort of a DNA or the RNA genetic material which is present in all living organisms, right from microorganisms like Escherichia coli to even to bacteriophages which are sometimes called as biological puzzles, right from algae to fungi through bryophytes and pteridophytes to gymnosperms to angiosperms. All nucleic acids are inherent with all these are the, with all these basic properties. Now next, many of the names which primarily I'd be mentioning here are important bits for a medical entrance and uh, here too we have in the historical ed edifice, first we have the scientist Brown who is associated with the discovery of the nucleus. Next we have is Mischer. Mischer was a doctor who isolated nuclein from the pus cells and he was the first person to discover nuclein or a nucleoprotein. And primarily the pattern of inheritance has been studied by Mendel, long way in 1900. Levin is a scientist who postulated that when we take the nitrogen basis, adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine are the basic components of nucleic acid. Griffith first established the evidence that DNA is a genetic material. Hershey and Chase were two important scientists who primarily determined the pattern of inheritance in a bacteriophage and they found out that the role of DNA as well as the proteins in terms of the sort of a genetic material and even they had given the sort of an evidence of the presence of the genetic material in bacteriophages. Next we have Avery. McLeod and McCarthy, three important scientists who again established that DNA is the infective principle and it is not the proteins. Later on we have a very important scientist whose name is Chargaff. Chargaff is associated with the base equivalence rules. base equivalence rules related to the nucleic acid. Then we have the monumental discovery of Watson and Crick who proposed the double helical model of the DNA and also suggested the information flow or the central dogma with relation to the sort of a DNA. Later on we had Frankel Conrad. Frankel Kondrat was a scientist who primarily worked out with relation to RNA as a genetic material in the case of the viruses. So when you look at the historical background of the DNA, the common names of scientists which come in in any competitive examination go within the gamut of these particular scientists and the most important being Chargaff. Chargaff, Hershey Chase experiment is a monumental experiment same is the case with relation to Griffith's experiment and then we have the Watson and Crick's model of the sort of a DNA. Watson and Crick's model of the DNA. The purpose of this concept base is to give you the ground rules before you solve the multiple choice questions which come in a competitive examination. So initially we would be studying for a while about the basic concepts and among the most important concepts we have primarily, when you look at the chemical analysis of the DNA, it is based primarily on Chargaff's rule. The Chargaff's rule dictates the chemical analysis of the DNA.
So, according to Chargaff, the DNA of various organisms vary in their base composition. How do organisms differ from each other? How does an Escherichia coli differ from that of an elephant? Or how does a rodent DNA differ from that of the human DNA? Primarily, we differ in terms of the base composition. So, the base composition is varied. in different sort of an organisms. Next, within a species, within a species, like if you take plant kingdom, if you take Rishia, or else you take Chlamydomonas, or else you take Homo sapiens, within a species, there is some regularity in the ratio of the bases. That is when you take the nitrogen bases, the nitrogen bases have a specified sort of a ratio equivalence. So, there is a specificity of the nitrogen bases within a species. In a species, it, the nitrogen bases are very, very specific. Now, always when you take the ad A is equal to T, adenine equals thymine and guanine equals cytosine. So, this is primarily termed as base equivalence. So, Chargaff had taken up different sort of species, he had, he had idolized the DNA and he had made an analysis of the adenine content, thymine content, gynosine content and also the cytosine content of different species. So, while studying, while taking, while analyzing these particular, the, the total quantitative content of adenine, thymine, gynosine and cytosine, he always found out that a by T is always equivalent to 1. A by T is 1 and again G by C is equal to 1. G by C is equal to 1. So, always the ratio of adenine to thymine, numerator by denominator is always 1. Similarly, gyanosine by cytosine is always equivalent to 1. So, when he had hydrolyzed the DNA and quantified the purines and the pyrimidines, he always, always found that a rule exists that is the 50 percent of the bases, 50 percent of the bases are purines and 50 percent of the bases are pyrimidines. We have 50 percent of the are purines and 50 percent of the pyrimidines or other way of expressing is we have the ATGC is equal to 1 or we can say always A is equal to T as well as G is equal to C. There could be multiple formats in the, on the basis of which they could be asking you about Chargaff's rule. So, when you say Chargaff's rule in an objective, you could be encountering these particular sort of phrases, three important phrases and as you understand, they are very, very specific for a species but they are varied in base composition among the species. The number of adenine residues the number of the adenine residues is always equal to the number of the thymine residues. the number of the thymine residues and the same is with relation to gynosin or guanine and cytosine. Always when you are looking at the numbers, the number of the adenine residues are always equivalent to the thymine residues, number of the guanine residues are always equivalent to cytosine. So, thereby we understand that purine residues purine residues is equal to the pyrimidine residues in the dna following chargaff's rule another options could be is in an objective we could be getting these three options 
Number of adenine is equal to thymine, guanine is equal to cytosine, purine residues is equal to pyrimidine residues. Hence, it could also be stated as A plus G oblique T plus C is equal to 1. But very, very importantly, A plus T a plus T oblique G plus C ratio varies, varies or the percentage of G C varies in organisms, in organisms. So, constancy relates to this, variation relates to, variation relates to this. The A plus T oblique G plus C ratio always varies, percentage GC always varies. So, when a DNA is extracted from a closely related species, if, it, if DNA are extracted from a closely related species, they have similar base composition, similar base composition. Like if you take two species belonging to family Astraceae their base composition could be very much related or two species of family Fabaceae could be closely related. Whereas widely different species have varied base composition. As an example, if you take an algae and if you take a fungi, both of them, they will have varied base compositions. Thereby, they would not be, really, they would not be related. And when you are talking in terms of or when you are discussing in terms of evolution, Evolution based on DNA analysis is termed as phylogenetic and it is acceptable. It is acceptable because the DNA base pairs have been conserved. have been conserved in the course of evolution. So this is a better evidence. We have morphological evidence, anatomical evidence, embryological evidence, but genetic evidence is more conservative in terms in view of the nitrogen basis which follow up with relation to Chargaff's rule. After finishing up Chargaff's rule which was a concept, we are now looking at the occurrence or the distribution of the DNA. We understand when you take DNA, DNA is termed as D oxy ribose nucleic acid. So it's made up of a nucleon, it is acidic in nature, it's made up of a 5 carbon sugar ribose from which oxygen is removed. So it is termed as deoxyribose nucleic acid. And when you take the deoxyribose nucleic acid or which is abbreviated as DNA, DNA on the timeline is distributed as follows. We have double stranded DNA. We have double stranded DNA. Next we have is single stranded DNA single stranded DNA. Then later on we also have double stranded RNA because we are dealing with relation to nucleic acids we have double stranded RNA as well as even we have single stranded RNA. Single stranded RNA. We are looking at where double stranded DNA is present in the biological world all eukaryotes all eukaryotes have double stranded dna same is the case for prokaryotic bacteria a prokaryotic bacteria has got a double stranded dna minus histones so it is not complex into histones and again double stranded dna is the genetic material in T even phages. 
when you take t even fibers they are t2 t4 t6 and so on bacteriophages which can infect a bacteria are termed as bacteriophages so commonly double stranded dna is present in eukaryotes prokaryotic bacteria and t even fibers there are exceptions to this one very standard example of the single stranded dna you have is phage x174 a phage is a virus which can infect a bacteria so phage x174 which has been discovered by shinshima which has been discovered by shinshima is a very important example of a single stranded dna and the same is same is the case for bacterial virus many of the bacterial viruses viruses are also single stranded dna the advantages of the single stranded dna is they are circular they can easily get into a plasmid they have an ori they also have marker genes and they are easy to disseminate in gene cloning when you take the double stranded rna double stranded rna is seen in the rio group of virus they are present in the rio group of virus as well as they are also present in the wound tumor virus of plants wound tumor virus of plants coming to single stranded rna the single stranded rna is seen in tmv tobacco mosaic virus which has been uh, studied by conrad then we also have influenza virus we also have influenza virus and poliomyelitis poliomyelitis virus bacterial virus bacterial virus f2 f2 and also r17 so while looking at the distribution of the dna and rna we understand double stranded single stranded double stranded we have examples of double stranded dna single stranded dna double stranded rna as well as single stranded rna so this chart primarily gives you a sort of a synopsis of the occurrence of nucleic acids in different sort of a in different examples of the biological world now we come to a very important component we are going to study the structure of the dna in terms of two important features first we'll be focusing on the chemical structure of the dna dna chemical structure we'll be studying the chemical structure of the dna it will be followed by the watson and crick's model and as we study this we'll try to put in the sort of a logistics when you take the dna the dna is basically a macromolecule it is a macromolecule it's a large molecule and it is a polymer it is a polymer of nucleotides it's a polymer of nucleotides so predominantly it's a biological macromolecule it's a biological macromolecule and when you look at the sugar the basic component is the sugar it has a carbon sugar carbon sugar and it is a five carbon compound hence it is principally made up of the pentose sugar 
Now, this is a very important point because in an objective they can ask you whether it is pentose or hexose or a triose. Predominantly, it is made up of a 5 carbon sugar and it is called a pentose sugar. Then, when you take the sugar minorities in a nucleic acid, what, what are the types? The types are, you got ribose, which goes, for, goes to form the ribose nucleic acid. We have the ribose. Then, we also have D oxy ribose. Deoxyribose implicates that from carbon 2, if you understand you got a 5 carbon sugar, you understand primarily you got 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So, we have from carbon 2, oxygen is lost. from carbon 2 and here it is with hydrogen alone, hydrogen is present, hydrogen is present instead of OH, it implies that in ribose you got the presence of OH whereas in deoxyribose that is the DNA. The DNA molecule is a pentose 5 carbon compound. Carbon is at carbon 2 oxygen is lost, thereby only hydrogen is present and instead of hydroxyl. So, this is the composition with relation to the pentose sugar. We are talking about first block which is termed as pentose. Next, we go to for the phosphodiester bonds. diester bonding. A phosphor, phosphorus bond which links up to esters, diester bond links the 3 dash carbon. If you take the DNA, the DNA is, the DNA can be configured or can be visualized as two ribbons, red and blue. So, on one side you got the blue ribbon, on the other side you got the red ribbon. Imagine a phosphodiester bond which links 3 carbon to a 5 carbon in the pentose. Links the 3 carbon to a 5 dash carbon in the pentose. So, we have primarily a pentose sugar and another pentose sugar. They are linked by means of a phosphorus and always a 3 carbon links up to a 5 carbon. 3 carbon is links up to a 5 carbon in a pentose sugar of the next successive nucleotide of the next successive nucleotide. Imagine nucleotides to be the steps or just like the steps in the railing. So, each of the steps, we got the steps and the steps are linked to sugars on both the sides and when you take a sugar and a sugar, a sugar and a sugar are linked by means of a sort of a phosphodiester bond. So, the sugar and the phosphate forms the backbone. Just like when you walk up a staircase, you hold up the banister and the banister is made up of a sugar minority a phosphorus and again a sugar minority. So, always a SPS forms the sort of a rail, forms the rail or it forms the backbone and how does the S and the P get linked up? The two S's are linked up by means of a phosphodiester bond. So, in a phosphodiester bond, you got two ester bonds and the two ester bonds link to what? It links to the third carbon which is present on the top and the fifth carbon which is present at the bottom and the 3 phosphorus and the 5 carbon, the phosphodiester bond is always like in the form of a turn between the successive nucleotides. So, on one side you, on one side you got the nucleotides, these are the nucleotides and the sugar and the phosphate, this forms the railing. 
or this forms a banister or this forms a backbone it forms a backbone and these are the basic steps these are the basic steps the nitrogen bases are the sort of basic steps they are the basic steps and this forms a railing banister and the backbone when you take the dna we understand that we have a phosphor diester bond the phosphor diester bond is primarily responsible for the stability of the dna how stable it is why does the sort of a dna not melt out what happens to it when there is a high temperature or a low temperature what happens when free radicals attack the sort of a dna what contributes to the stability of the dna is primarily due to the presence of the phosphor diester bonds so we have a polynucleotide chain of a new polynucleotide chain of the dna it is made up of many nucleotides and they run in opposite directions they run in opposite directions so when you take the two ends when you take the two ends of the polynucleotide chain the two ends are of opposite polarity they are of opposite polarity so a dna molecule resembles two trains go traveling they are of opposite polarity in the in the double helix we find that this is a double helix so the most important property of the double helix is opposite polarity and when you say opposite polarity the two ends are not the same the two ends are not the same that is you take this end as well as you take this particular end both of them are not the same we have a 3 dash end the 3 dash end always has a hydroxyl group whereas if you take the 5 dash chain Five dash end, the five dash tail. It always has a phosphate group. So this is a very important concept. When you take the when you when you take the sort of an opposite, what is the meaning of the term opposite polarity? The opposite, the two ends are not the same. One of the ends has got a three dash group. Whether wherever you have a three dash end, it has got an OH group. And wherever you got a five dash end, it has a phosphate group. So the OH and the phosphate group are present at both are, are present at opposite sides of the DNA. Now, when you take the nitrogen bases, we have finished off with relation to the sugars. We have finished off with relation to the phosphor diester molecule, phosphor diester bonds. We looked at. opposite polarity we are coming to the third component which is termed as a nitrogen base what are the parental nitrogen compounds which are present in the dna the parental nitrogen compounds which are present in the dna are the purines and the pyrimidines and the pyrimidines they are termed as a parental nitrogen bases in the dna and when you take purines the purines are always double ringed they are double ringed and they are nine membered they have nine carbons they are nine membered and when you take the purines which is double ringed and nine membered you have adenine it is made up of adenine the adenine has n h 2 it has n h 2 at carbon 6 at carbon 6 adenine has got n h 2 while when you take guanine when you take guanine it has n h 2 at carbon 2 at carbon 2 and 
it has O at carbon 6. So what exactly is the difference between the adenines and the guanines among the purines? If we take the purines, we have the, it's made up of the adenine, NH2 is present at carbon 6 and again when you take the sort of a guanine, we, at, uh, we have at the carbon 2 we have got NH2 and uh, we have got oxygen which is present at C6. So taking nitrogen basis, we have purines as well as we have pyrimidines. Coming to pyrimidines, pyrimidines are 6 membered. Pyrimidines are six membered. They are single ring compounds. Single ring pentose compounds with oxygen at carbon 2. We have oxygen at carbon 2. So, how do the purines and pyrimidines differ from each other? If we take the purine, they are double ring. Pyrimidines are single ring, they are 9 membered, these are 6 membered. Again, pyrimidines have an add on with relation to presence of oxygen at carbon 2. Among the pyrimidines, we have two, three important types. First one, we have a cytosine. We have a cytosine. Next, we have a thymine. cytosine and thymine which are both components of the DNA and in the case of the cytosine NH2 is present NH2 is located at carbon position number 4 carbon position number 4 while thymine has oxygen at carbon 4 it has oxygen at carbon 4 and CH3 at carbon 5. CH3 at carbon 5. So, how do the cytosines and the thymines they differ in terms of C4 at carbon 4? We have NH2 in the case of cytosine, we have oxygen in the case of thymine. In addition to this, thymine has also got so at C5, it has got the presence of CH3. Coming to uracil. Uracil is present in the RNA. Uracil is exclusively present in the RNA and it has oxygen at C4. It has oxygen at C4. Thus, when you make a chemical analysis of the nitrogen bases, when you study them, we understand it's glue, it can be categorized into purines and pyrimidines. And again, how do cytosines differ from thymines? And cytosine and thymine, how do they differ from an uracil? So, this is a simplified version of the molecular structure of the nitrogen basis. Many questions predominantly ask you with relation to what is the type of the sugar, what is the phosphodiester bond, what do you understand by opposite polarity, what are the nitrogen bases, what exactly are the differences in, the, in terms of the chemical structure of the purines versus the pyrimidines. How many carbons? What are the how are they single ring or double ring? What is the position of the hydrogen? What is the position of the oxygen? And how do they differ with relation to C2 as well as with relation to loss of hydrogen or oxygen or an hydroxyl ion? Now we predominantly we come in to the study the chemical structure of the DNA. When you take the chemical structure of the DNA, we understand that the sugar, the backbone is made up of the sugar and the phosphate. Backbone is predominantly made up of the sugar and the phosphate forms the backbone. Then how does the sugar and the phosphate, how do they occur? They occur alternatively. That is, you have a sugar, sugar, and then you have got a phosphate. Then again, you got a phosphate and a sort of a sugar. They occur alternatively. Then, when you take the nitrogen basis, the nitrogen basis, 
you have a pure ion pure ion which is made up of two fused rings a larger ring linked to a pyrimidine which is a single heterocyclic link so you have a pure ion pyrimidine combination the watson and crick combination is pure ion and pyrimidine the pure ion and the pyrimidine combined together it is a two fused ring whereas this is a single heterocyclic ring now in dna and rna the pure ions are the same that is they are only made up of adenine and guanine in dna and rna pure ions are the same again a very important bit pure ions are the same that is we have the adenine and the guanine remain the same in the dna and the rna in dna the pyrimidines are cytosine and thymine are cytosine and thymine in the rna in the rna the pyrimidines are cytosine and uracil so uracil is a characteristic feature of rna uracil the pyrimidine uracil is a characteristic feature of the rna so how do primarily when you take the basic things like mostly the questions they could be asking you is how are the pure ions in dna and rna how exactly are the pyrimidines differing from the dna and the rna in terms of ct as well as c and u that is t does not exist t does not exist now we are coming to the next level we are trying to look at the terminologies of a nucleoside and a nucleotide the nucleoside and the nucleotide the basic monomeric one level monomeric unit of the dna is termed as a nucleotide so nucleotide is the monomeric unit and a nucleotide is made up of a nitrogen base It is made up of a nitrogen base a pentose sugar and a phosphate which constitutes the building blocks which constitutes the building blocks whereas a nucleoside in simple a nucleoside in simple is a nucleotide minus the phosphate supposing the phosphate is taken off it is termed as a nucleoside and predominantly when you take a nucleotide the nucleotide is made up of a compound called nuclein which has been discovered by mister and the nuclein is an acidic molecule it is acidic molecule hence when you take dna and dissolve it in water we find the water becomes acidic so it is acidic and nuclein primarily gives rise gives rise to a polynucleotide chain polynucleotide chain and the polynucleotide chain is nothing but the nucleic acid
Hence, DNA when isolated looks suspended like a sort of a gel in water. It is very easy to isolate the sort of a DNA when you have to primarily remove, uh, you got to primarily remove the other phosphates, then you have the free DNA which just can suspend in water. We had had a look at the introduction to the DNA. We had said um, DNA primarily is made up of what exactly is the difference between the DNA and the RNA. Next, we had looked at the properties of nucleic acids. Third, we had looked at what exactly is the differences or the types of the sugars and the nitrogen bases which are present in the DNA. Now, we come to a very important discovery that is the studies of the DNA in terms of X-ray diffraction. When you take Rosalind Franklin, and Wilkins, Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins isolated the fibers of the DNA. They had isolated DNA fibers. And DNA fibers were subjected to X-ray diffraction. The sample of DNA fibers was subjected to X-ray diffraction. When it was subjected to X-ray diffraction, there was scatter. And primarily because of the scatter, it they could characterize the atomic weight. they could deduce the atomic weight of the DNA. On determining the atomic weight, they could understand the spatial arrangement of molecules. Of molecules within the DNA. So, this was the first evidence to state that the DNA molecule is in the form of a helix, is in the form of the helix and it could give the sort of a clue of the space between two nucleotides as well as the diameter of the helix as well as the number of turns of the helix and also the symmetry of the helix, whether it is right handed or left handed. So, the di X-ray diffraction uh, studies by Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins is an important hallmark or an important milestone in the discovery of the DNA. So, by scatter diagram or by X-ray diffraction, they could deduce the atomic structure which led to the three dimensional model of the DNA. Rosalind and Franklin and Wilkins gave the first evidence to state that the DNA is helical. This is exactly seen in the form of dark X spots or dark crescents which indicate 0.34 nanometers distance between the nitrogen stands. So, when an X-ray photograph was taken, we have the scatter diagram and any sort of a dark X spot indicated that there is a turn in the DNA. There is a turn in the DNA and all the dark crescents exactly could give the distance as 0.34 nanometers is the sort of a distance between the sort of a steps of the nitrogen basis. 
So the 3D model gave the first evidence to state that there are two distinct regularities in the DNA. The two distinct regularities in the DNA which is universal in all living organisms because DNA forms the master molecule is first one is the first regularity was presence of 0.34 nanometers has a space between the steps and 3.4 nanometers has the sort of a distance along the axis of the molecule along the axis of the molecule now uh, you understand that 1 nanometer 1 nanometer is equal to 10 angstrom units so notice of two distinct regularities stating 0.34 nanometers as well as 3.4 nanometers and the helical structure was the detective evidences of Franklin and Wilkins by X-ray diffraction studies. Rosalind Franklin and Wilkins. Shortly you will understand that Rosalind Franklin did not get the Nobel Prize but only Watson, Crick and Wilkins had got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the DNA. Many of the statements and the concepts which you study in the DNA are individually and collectively, logically as an assumption as well as a direction are important bits for a multiple choice. Now we come to the model of the DNA, we had finished off on occurrence, we had gone through the chemical structure. Now we are coming into the, we are going to study the Watson and Crick's double helical model. The postulates Watson and Crick's model of the DNA. Their paper hardly went in for about one and a half pages, but it is one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. One of the most important discoveries of the 20th century was the elucidation of the double helical model. So the basic tenets of the Watson and Crick's model runs as such. First one is it is made up of two polynucleotide chains. The DNA is made up of two polynucleotide chains. Second it is a right handed helix. It is a right handed helix that is it is twisted clockwise. Third it shows antipolarity. When we understand antipolarity it means anti parallel or opposite polarity. It is otherwise termed as anti parallel. So, we have two strands which are anti parallel. One of the strands has got a 5 dash head and a 3 dash tail. It starts with a 5 dash head and ends with a 3 dash tail, and both the chains, in both the chains, it is predominantly it is vice versa. The sugar and the phosphate, sugar and the phosphate forms the backbone and it is present on the outside. It is present on the periphery. While when you take the nitrogen bases, the nitrogen bases are flat and they are perpendicular to the long axis of the DNA. If you imagine a hypothetical axis and we have the nitrogen bases 
these are the nitrogen bases whereas you have the sugar and the phosphate on either sides so we understand that the nitrogen bases are flat they are stacked like coins they are stacked like coins they are analogous to coins which are stacked they follow a twist they follow a twist or a turn so they are arranged just like the steps in a banister they are stacked like coins and they follow a twist or a turn nitrogen bases flat stack like follow a twist and the nitrogen bases are always perpendicular to the long axis of the dna so polynucleotide chains right handed helix anti parallel opposite directions backbone sugar phosphate nitrogen being nitrogen base is being flat and stacked with a twist the nitrogen bases are bonded by hydrogen bonds are linked by hydrogen bonds hydrogen bonds are weak chemical bonds they are easy to denature by heat and again the presence of hydrogen bonds enables specific pairing as well as it enables for the dna to break down especially when it when I mean, it's got to go for replication now when you take the hydrogen bonds the specific pairings which are allowed the specific pairings which are allowed are a double bond t adenine with thymine and guanine triple bond with c these are the specific pairings which are allowed in the dna now the atgc pairing is allowed has per chargaff's rules there is a specific pairing type of pairing and it follows chargaff's rules and the specificity of the pairing the specificity of the pairing is otherwise termed as complementary pair bearing is otherwise termed as complementary base pairing complementary base pairing so it implies that the nucleotide sequence a very important statement the nucleotide sequence nucleotide sequence in one strand in one strand dictates the nucleotide sequence dictates the nucleotide sequence in the other this is a very important dictum of specificity or complementary base pairing in the dna so due to specific base base pairing we have a double bond t and 3 g triple bond c which follows chargaff's rules as a corollary we have a complementary base pairing and due to complementary base pairing we always find that once a nucleotide sequence in one strand is given the nucleotide in the other sequence automatically comes in so this is a very important sort of property of the dna normal objective bits they could ask you if on one strand of the chain or if a one chain if on one chain of the dna we have phi dash we have ta ttc ta ttc cga and it is 3 dash if on one chain the sequence of the nitrogen bases are such then what is the sequence on the other chain what is the sequence on the other chain it follows that this should be 3 dash and this end should be the 5 dash 
and as implied it can be it should be ata it is ata ag it is ag gct which follows specifically when you look at this particular sequence we know it follows chargaff's rules of base pairing now coming to the coming to the other properties of the dna we understand in the other pair, uh, other properties of the dna the base pairs the base pairs are 0.34 nanometers apart the distance between two nitrogen bases 0.34 nanometers apart a complete turn of the helix takes 360 degrees the twist takes 360 degrees hence the dimension of the dna molecule dimension of the dna molecule is 3.4 is 3.4 nanometers the reasons being there are 10 base pairs per turn per turn there are 10 base pairs 3.4 into 10 we primarily get 34 and the external diameter external diameter is always 2 nanometers these are the typical sort of a standards of a a sort of a dna a dna structure has got it it can on a complete turn it takes an angle of 360 hence the dimensions are 3.4 nanometers and thereby there are only 10 base pairs per turn and as implied when you take the dna in the dna there are three important forms of dna it could be an a dna or it could be a b dna or it could also be a z dna while we are reading on the different types of dna we'll be learning about the a b and the z dna another variations the two sugar phosphate backbones are not equally spaced from one another along the helix when you take the sugar phosphate backbones the two sugar phosphate backbones are not equally spaced the space is not equal along the helix while you look along the helix so along the helix it is spirally turned and the reason why it is spirally turned is there are unequal size groups there are unequal size grooves on one side it could be major there could be a major groove the major groove is wider while if you take the smaller one it is termed as minor groove which is narrower so when you take the backbones within the backbones you got spaces which normally can fit in just like a glove box so different sort of a proteins called dna proteins interact at these spaces so a dna protein could come in and fix over here similarly if you got a smaller sort of a dna protein the smaller dna protein can come and fix over here so these are all primarily termed as dna proteins now dna proteins are responsible for replication for repair 
for mutation, for change in the primary structure of the DNA and for any modifications in the sort of a DNA. So, they are involved in both in gene expression as well as in gene regulation. They are involved in repair, mutation, primary structure, modifications, gene expression as well as in gene regulations. So, we are going to understand that always DNA has, the concept is DNA has both major groups as well as even minor groups which are the areas of DNA protein interactions thereby there is no constancy of the space within the sort of a DNA it can slightly it can fluctuate Nineteen sixty two is a very important year in the twentieth century, whereby the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine had been given to Francis Crick. Francis Crick, Watson, Watson, Morris Wilkins. for their discoveries concerning the molecular structure concerning the molecular structure of nucleic acids hence the relevance of study of chemistry of nucleic acids is more important than just exactly knowing the model of the watson and crick the molecular structure of the nucleic acids and its significance and its significance for information transfer for information transfer genetic information transfer in living organisms Parallelly, Crick had pro always proposed that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes proteins. This pathway is termed as the central dogma or the faith of molecular biology. So, as according to the central dogma of say, molecular biology, DNA is the master molecule, RNA is the template, which in turn gives rise to the proteins. The process by means how DNA makes RNA is typically termed as transcription. From RNA to proteins is termed as translation. And we have the information flow from the level of the nucleotides, especially the sequence of the nucleotides, which dictates the sequence of the amino acids. In the proteins, in the proteins. The one si important scientist who had been missing from this had been Rosalind Franklin. So, it is an enigma why Rosalind Franklin had not been given the Nobel Prize.